Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome to the zoo. Uh, we're very delighted to host this this morning and I was really surprised all of you showed up this morning considering the weather. So thank you very, very, very much, all you beautiful people. Um, when I was asked to do this talk, I have to admit that I don't consider myself to be creative at all. But I am a scientist and as scientists we are somewhat curious. That's kind of the nature of what we do. But one thing I am always curious about is what people do and how they got where they got uh, in life. And that's actually what I decided to talk about today. It was really easy for me to think I could talk about conservation. That's probably, for lack of a better word, the low-hanging fruit. Uh, to talk about all the wonderful things here, of which I do know I'm being upstaged by the fantastic white-handed Gibbons behind me. Um, so enjoy, enjoy them. But really the curiosity for me is, is talking to people and hopefully inspiring people about their own personal paths. And it sounds like that's kind of what you guys are all about. So what a really, really cool group. Um, and I actually think I might become part of this group because it's really kind of a fantastic uh, group of people that I have come to learn a little bit about. So I'll tell you a bit about me, but the curious questions I was going to hopefully answer. Some of you did not probably notice that a dog snuck in the room. Um, some of you back over here probably did see him. Uh, but I'm going to tell you about what I do, what my job does, because if you think about well, Vice President of Conservation at the zoo, you might be thinking, what on earth does she do every day? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do every day, and then how I got here. That's really the interesting picture. And then what's up with the lizard and the dog? Of all the fantastic animals I could have had Sierra bring you today, I chose a lizard and a dog. Probably not exactly what you might have thought, but I'll explain why. But particularly for me, the star of my show and the question that you guys got asked when you came in today was what animal do you identify with the most? And for me, there's no question. I get to work with thousands of species on a daily basis. I get to see these incredible species every day. But the species that changed the trajectory of my career was a dog. It was my dogs at home. And literally, they changed my life. And I'll actually explain how and why. Um, but I have no doubt that had they not been in my life when they were in my life, I wouldn't be here. I was headed down a very, very different path. So when you think about what do you need to do to become Vice President of Conservation at Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium, we're not really little potatoes when it comes to a zoo. Any ideas what you'd have to go to school for? Zoology. Zoology. That makes perfect sense. That's a really good one. It makes perfect sense. Environmental science. I, pardon, I didn't hear it. Environmental science. Environmental science. Another really good one. Perfect sense. That was not the path I took. So what I get to do every day, well, not every day. I get to hold baby Fusta. I get to hug a penguin. I got to do that just like a week and a half ago. If you watch any of our Facebook Lives, you see me do Facebook Lives. Giraffe, I get kissed by giraffe. Oh, I might have got to hug a baby cheetah. I might have got to feed more cheetahs. But what I really do, I actually don't do that every day. What I really do is actually I'm highly administrative. Ugh. That is the majority of what I do. Originally, and when I got hired here originally in 2005 and up until January of last year, so I've only been in this position since January of last year, all of the scientists that are here at the zoo, there's four departments of science that work over in our Center for Conservation and Research. It includes nutrition, rare plants, conservation genetics, and reproductive physiology. All those big brain people were pretty much left to their own devices. <laughs> Um, we all reported to the director and CEO of the zoo, whether it was Dr. Simmons or Dennis Pate. And scientists, anybody in here a scientist? No, you all are artists. That's, fun. That's really fun. <laughs> That's really fun for me. Scientists, kind of, we sort of do our own thing. Uh, so that was good and bad to be left on our own. And we all, but the problem was is that Dennis had a lot of direct reports. So he needed somebody who could kind of come direct the scientists. And so that's a large part of what I do. So I oversee those guys. And I also oversee all of our global conservation programming, which is super fun. We help support nearly 50 projects around the world in key areas that include Africa, Asia, Madagascar. I just mentioned our conservation genetics team. They actually spend 
about 95% of their time working in Madagascar. Uh, the head of that department is actually leaving next Friday to go back. We have a scientist already over there. She'll be headed back over here. So they kind of cross each other's paths. Um, oceans, we do a lot of work with oceans. Uh, Asia, we have our new Asia Highlands exhibit that will be opening later this year. Uh, and North America and South America. So those are the big key regions that we help support around the world. And so I manage the money and the funding that we send to those organizations and I help evaluate the projects, new projects that we might want to become a part of. So that's the big nuts and bolts of what I do. I also, a large part of what I do is interpret science. I actually, and that's a really big deal for an organization like us. And that was something that our director, Dennis Pate, said he desperately needed. He needed somebody who could help him understand all of the sciences so that he could help direct um, what we do here. So that that gets to be part of everything. That's part of marketing. So I interface with our marketing department. I interface with our education department. And I interpret all of that science so that everybody in all of those departments can understand it. And it's not very much fun to talk to a scientist sometimes, right? If you go back to college and you had to take a science class, remember that professor. <laughs> so <laughs> I end up being the one that actually interprets a lot of that stuff and explains it to people. So interpreting science is a big deal. The other part of my world that to me is probably my heart and what I truly love doing, and it's actually why I left the zoo and went to become a professor at Iowa State. And then I ended up coming back in January. But I love teaching and I love mentoring students, and that's why I wanted to go be a professor, um, and I still get to do that. That was something I said I had to be able to do in my job here. So I currently work with a PhD student at Iowa State. She's actually here right now. Um, I have an intern who's in the room today. She's my first intern. Megan is back, sitting back in the back of the room. And I have two high school students through our Zoo Academy program that come shadow with me twice a week. So, Helping young scientists understand their next path is something very critically important to me. But mostly I like working with those young people because if I had sat down with my 20-year-old self and said, hey, 20-year-old self, guess what you're doing in 20 years? <gasps> I would have kind of melted down. First off, PhD, getting a PhD was not even anywhere on my radar at all. I only thought that was for smart people. And then if you'd have told me that I was going to be managing other PhDs, I would have thrown up all over the table. <laughs> so how do you explain to those young people, you know, you don't need to get in so much of a hurry. Perhaps it's opportunities along the way and challenges that you accept and curiosities. Curiosities that you kind of go, oh, I want to know a little bit more about that. That's pretty much what happened. So how did I go from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum? I was very lucky that I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm in New Mexico. My grandfather raised cotton and alfalfa, and my mother raised and trained quarter horses. And anybody in here ever have a parent as a coach or a teacher? Yeah, not fun. My mother was a brilliant horsewoman, and I absolutely despised being trained by my mother. So about middle school, I decided that I was going to do something that she knew nothing about. And I, my dad let me buy a, a show steer. I bought a calf, a beef calf. And I was like, ha, mom knows nothing. And this is all me. The problem was I didn't know anything either. Um, but I learned. I was curious about show cattle. I had friends that showed livestock. I, was in the, I did the whole 4-H FFA thing. Isn't it starting to make sense how I ended up where I ended up? Not so much. So I was showing calves, and there were two things that I knew by the time I was in high school. I knew that I loved animals. I knew that I was put on this earth to be a steward of animals. All of them, I loved them all. Well, I didn't actually like reptiles. Hmm. But I had a lizard come see you guys this morning. I didn't like them, but I loved everything else, particularly all livestock. I still loved my horses, and I still did continue to show and let my mom boss me around and tell me what to do. But I also got really into showing cattle really into it. And I took off after I graduated from my bachelor's degree and I showed cattle for a year and that was like running off to the circus, according to my parents. They could not figure out why on earth I was doing this. Part of it is because, and I'm sure many of you have been around those 20 year olds that are just so lost and confused. After they get done with college, they're like, I don't know what I'm gonna do now. That was totally me, totally me. My bachelor's degree I had received in human nutrition. 
And what I loved about human nutrition was the health part of nutrition. I also had gained a lot of appreciation for nutrition because of showing livestock. Diet made a huge difference in how those animals performed and how they looked. And I found that really, really interesting. Um, but I knew that I didn't want to tell people what to eat because nobody was going to tell me what to eat. In fact, the best thing about getting a nutrition degree, I can justify eating a donut on Friday morning and a heart-shaped donut, no doubt. But I loved teaching, too, and I was actually hired because of my, the show background that I had. That was kind of an interesting skill set. I was asked to teach a class at New Mexico State University. And I taught a class, and while I was there, and this, gets, this is even more curious, I met a professor. He was a professor of a course that I took while I was there because I was still dabbling with what I was going to do next. Maybe I'll become a high school science teacher was what I thought. And he said, young lady, you are not using your talent. I was like, okay, I don't know what talent that is. And he said, you like nutrition and you love cattle. You love beef cattle. I said, yeah. And he said, well, you ought to go get your master's degree in, cattle, in beef cattle nutrition. Okay. I didn't even know that was a thing. So, okay. I was like, you clearly are smarter than I am. You know something I don't. So that's what I did. I ended up going from New Mexico to Ames, Iowa. Yay! I moved to the Midwest and I started a master's degree in feedlot cattle nutrition. Feedlot cows to vice president of conservation. <laughs> Makes perfect sense, right? And through the course of that, that is when I ended up, I had two little rat terriers, Minnie and Sparky. And Sparky on the left was a unique little terrier. Anybody have terriers? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> they, are, they are evil, evil, evil. And there's one in the room. They're actually, they're fantastic. They're fantastic fun. But Sparky was a unique terrier because terriers are all about me. They're like, me, 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 me. Sparky wasn't. He loved everybody. And so I was like, oh, it'd be really fun to train him to be a therapy dog. But again, nothing that I knew about. So I had to be a little bit curious and start figuring out how I was going to teach this little guy how to become a therapy dog. And during the course of my master's degree, remember I kept thinking PhDs were only for really smart people. I realized that I actually loved research. I loved it. And funny thing, when you're in Iowa and you're in beef cattle nutrition, any ideas what my research was about other than beef cows? Corn. <laughs> Corn and cows. That was it. And I told my advisor, I said, you know, I, I really love research and I really love what I'm doing. And I think maybe I could get a PhD. Maybe I'm, not, I'm smart enough. But I really care more about making the cows healthy. And that's not really what we're doing. I care more about the health of the animal than I do about the product. And he said, Cheryl, you need to go get a PhD in companion animal nutrition. <laughs> that sounded like the dumbest thing ever. I'm going to go from humans to cows to dogs. Again, I said, OK. Big old question marks over my head. But I kept thinking, that guy's a lot smarter than me, too. So I'm going to listen to him. And I'm going to go try something. I'm going to go do something different. Still had this little guy with me, still had Minnie with me. I moved to Champaign, Illinois, and started my PhD program. And that is when I really started getting into dog training. I met some people while I was in grad school working on my PhD in dog nutrition. And I started training him for agility, because these crazy people, they all had border collies, and they played agility. And I was like, that's kind of fun. I've only seen it on TV, and I have a tiny little dog, but I'll try it. It's the most addicting thing ever. <laughs> Dogs learn so fast, and I was intrigued at how fast they learned. And so I got more and more and more curious about what I could teach him to do and the tricks he could do. And he became a pretty good little agility dog, but he was older. So you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Baloney. He was seven years old before I even started teaching him any of this. Anything to become a therapy dog or anything to compete in agility. Then I got another dog. You know, after you have one, they just keep coming. <laughs> and he was a little toy fox terrier. And we started comp I started competing with Keegan. His name was Keegan. And that's about the time I got hired here at the Omaha Zoo. It was 2005. I was hired here by Doc Simmons to be the, dir the director of comparative nutrition 
Because you see, which I did not see at the time, why I even applied for the position is curious, but I thought, a zoo in Omaha? You gotta be kidding. Who knew? And here is Watson. Hi, buddy. Hi, buddy. So, Terrier, Watson is part of our interactive animal program. And the interactive animal program that Sierra was also um, introduced you to our wonderful Chinese crocodile lizard, Francis. I saw some of you taking pictures of him. Uh, but they are part of a program that I helped develop before I left for Iowa State. And Watson's part of our team here. He works directly with our keepers, obviously doing tricks. But nobody got upset when the dog walked in the room, right? It's kind of hard to be upset when a dog walks in the room. Uh, dogs are kind of fun that way. They do lots of things medically to us to lower our blood pressure and increase our oxytocin, and I could talk about all the really fun science behind all of that. Um, but that's not why he's part of our family here at the Omaha Zoo. He's part of our family here at the Omaha Zoo so that we can interact with people. And that's why we have the interactive animal program and why training animals is so incredibly important. But their brains, they enjoy learning and they're curious just like we are. And we reward them for behaviors that we really, really love. By positive reinforcement, she gives him a, she gives him a, a cue that he's done a really good job. That click that you might be hearing is actually Sierra telling Watson, dude, you just did a really awesome job, thank you very much. Now you get to have your version of a donut. Or a little bitty bit of a donut. And that was what made me so incredibly curious about training. It's also why I loved teaching, because the brain of a kid is not any different than the brain of a dog. And it's all about positive reinforcement. And it's all about training. And teaching had to be fun. You cannot teach a dog how to do agility, especially how to do weave poles really fast, if they're not having fun. And they're not going to do it fast if they're not having fun. So training had to be really fun, and that was becoming part of the culture here. And I was really, really glad that I got to be part of that program. But when I started here in 2005, um, is anybody going to the Valentine's dinner that we have here? Oh, that's, <laughs> Emily is. That's too bad. That's something you should do. You will actually meet this guy here on the left. This is Jesse Krebs. He is our curator of reptiles and amphibians. And that guy made me fall in love with lizards. That guy made me fall in love with frogs the very first week I was here because he came into my office and he said, I'm so glad you're here. You have got to tell me how much my alligators need to eat. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yep, yep, I know about humans and I know about cows and I know about dogs. Score. So I had to learn a lot, but that was the really cool thing. That's the really cool thing about science and curiosity is curiosity, that's, it's knowledge gaps. It's all about knowledge gaps. And I was like, well, I'm a scientist. I think I can figure things out. And so I started figuring things out. I started doing some research to help Jesse figure those things out. And he also showed me how alligators can be trained. So I actually asked these guys if they could bring you an alligator. And they said, no, Cheryl, we're not going to bring an alligator to treetops. Because our big alligators in kingdoms of the night are actually target trained. Just like Watson is, he's targeted to Sierra's hand. Those alligators are target trained. It's really crazy. The keepers can tap a, a stick on the ground and the alligators will walk out like, hi, here I am. You see on TV people wrestling with alligators and taping their mouths shut. Notice that alligator's mouth isn't taped. Jesse can do that. First week I was here, he had me go in and do that. And I called my mom and said, guess what I did? She's like, that zoo is going to get you killed. <laughs> they haven't yet, mom. But pretty fantastic animal training going on here. And that was something that I was, had become a huge, huge, huge part of my life. <laughs> then being upstage again. Thank you, guys. I think Sierra's probably going to be mingling around with, with Watson. But then, um, and Keegan and I actually went all over the country um, competing, uh, made several, several attempts and finals and national championships. And then I decided that I was kind of good at agility and I would go to the dark side. And I wanted to know what it was like to train a border collie. <laughs> and nobody needs a border collie. You just don't. But I thought, I'm going to give that a whirl. 
And a friend of mine back in Illinois where I had started dog training sent me this photo. And he said, Cheryl, here's your puppy. She was found wandering the Walmart parking lot and she is currently at Champaign County Animal Control. I was like, okay. So I drove all the way back to Illinois and I adopted her, named her Karma the instant I saw her. And on the way back, she destroyed the back seat of my car. <laughs> and I was like, yep, this is gonna be a fun ride. And it has been a pretty incredible ride. She ended up a heck of a lot better. And again, she's a rescue dog, and I was competing with all of those professional people. Um, but we have been literally from one end of this country to the other end of this country because she just had a ton of talent. And we have, to date, been in seven finals at national events. Um, and in the course of that was when I had, so I'm still training, I'm still competing, I'm still competing with Karma, by the way, all this time. I was really enjoying things here, and faculty back at Iowa State said, would you come back here to teach? Would you come back here to teach and do research? And I was like, oh, but I, you know, I started this program here, I really love what I'm doing, my life is here, and teaching, students. Had it not been for key people helping point me in different directions where I could keep learning and growing, I don't know where I'd have been. So I thought, you know, that sounds like a really good thing I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back to Iowa State. Director here was very sad. And he came up with this idea, well, why don't we pay your summer salary and you can still manage our diets while you're in Ames. And I said, okay, that'll work out. So I was still affiliated with the zoo even when I was at Iowa State. And I absolutely loved it. I taught three classes. All of the research that I conducted was still research that was based in improving the uh, lives of the animals here at the zoo, whether that be through training or whether that be through nutrition. So I was a pretty happy camper. And then in 2013 was when Karma and I went to, we qualified for the National Agility Championship in Reno. And <clears throat> I actually have that run. It's kind of fun to watch. So we went to Reno and this was our finals run. After three runs, we had found ourselves sitting in third, uh, fourth place overall. So I thought you might want to see a little Karma. I ran really fast that night. This is Cheryl Morris and Karma. Cheryl says, I never thought I'd open one of those border collie things and now look at her in the finals in the 16 inch That's what I'm talking about. You cannot get a dog to do all that that fast, do everything correctly. She has to hit the yellow, not knock any bars. Woo! So it's all about teaching. It's all about training. Training whether I'm teaching a student or I'm training the dogs, it's all the same to me. It's all the same. Everything has to be. It's a new skill. They have to be curious about it. You have to make them want to learn it. And boy, they better think it's fun. If I tried to make her do that, if Sierra tried to make Watson do anything he was doing, we wouldn't be so very, very successful. Karma would not be thinking that's a big old game. She thinks that's a game. She's 11 years old now. We are going one more time to Reno next month. Um, so it'll be her last, uh, her last weekend jumping 16 inches, then she gets to go into semi-retirement. Um, but pretty awesome ride. And for a little rescue dog that was found wandering a Walmart parking lot, it's pretty cool. But what she's taught me is that everybody can excel. Everybody. You can be the underdog and still go whoop everybody's butt. You just have to be curious about wanting to learn and it better be fun. Life's kind of fun when you're curious about things. At least I think it is. So she has more letters behind her name and in front of her name than I do. Uh, but that is actually her AKC title. So anybody who ever thought that you can't do things with a mutt, she's not a mutt, she's a purebred dog, but she's definitely not an AKC dog. Well, AKC recognizes her in a pretty big way. So she's been, pretty, she's been a pretty amazing young, young dog to work with, and so is Keegan. All my dogs are pretty awesome and fantastic. But at that point in life, I was pretty sure I was on top of the world. I had a great job. I was doing, I mean, I'm a scientist. I'm curious. I get to do research. I get to teach. I've got this awesome dog life. Everything was perfect. And then I was coming back. I came back because I was still affiliated with the zoo. I was coming back on a regular basis. And I had lunch with Dennis Pate one day. And I was telling him all about the great things that were going on. And he posed some questions to me. 
very serious. And he looked at me and he said, are you really where you were meant to be? Well, yeah, I think so. Have you ever wondered about what's next? No. I like what I'm doing. I'm really happy. Huh. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Pate. I hadn't thought about that, but now I'm thinking about that. What if your teaching was in a different place, in a different element? Because he knew I loved teaching. He knew I loved it. I talked about teaching students and working with students every time I came back. And he said, what if you could teach, but it was just a different way of teaching? Hmm. And that's curious, too. And then, let me just put one more in there. What if you could make a bigger impact for animals? Oh. How? <laughs> he left out the administrative part. <laughs> he told me about all the other fun things I would get to do, and he just left out that, and then you'll be managing. That's not the fun part of anything. But. So it's curiosity. There's literally curiosity. So in the beginning, it might not have made one lick of sense how I ended up in the position I ended up. But two things were always clear. One, I loved animals, and it didn't matter what animal it was. I loved learning about them. That Chinese crocodile lizard. I saw some of you guys taking pictures of him, little Francis. That is an endangered species from Asia. We are losing them. We are losing them to habitat loss. We are losing them to the pet trade. And that is how I get to make a bigger impact. We get to tell people, I get to work with Sierra, I get to work with wonderful, wonderful interns, and we get to help spread the word that conservation is not an animal problem. Conservation's a people problem. And it's a really big people problem. And I'm an introvert, and I like animals a whole lot more than I like people. But I also know that we have got to embrace people and we have got to embrace creativity so that we can help solve some of the world's problems that then impact our animal world. So that's why I came back and that's why I am in the position that I am in. And I am very grateful for the opportunity to have been here. And this statement, when I read it last week on the email and then it was said again this morning, really incredible to wonder about the things you don't know and to actively fill those gaps with knowledge is to constant, consciously enrich your life. We talk about animal enrichment here at the zoo all the time, but we don't often talk about enriching human life and curiosity truly enriches our life. Training animals enriches their, their lives. Training, teaching, learning, it's all enriching. And never underestimate the power of a dog. Because they, without them, I probably would have not been so curious about animal training. I wouldn't have been so curious about learning something different. And I probably would have stayed over on the ruminant nutrition side and never became a comparative nutritionist. And boy, am I glad I did. So thank you so much for the opportunity to visit with you this morning. I don't know if there are questions. There are questions. If you have any thoughts or questions. <laughs> yes. The red panda. What would you like to know about the red panda? Anything? Yeah. Anything. Red pandas are becoming part of our collection because of Asia. So that was a new, we just had a new release, a new press release for her. Um, she's a young red panda, but red pandas are, of course, part of the Asia habitat. We work with the Red Panda Network. That's the conservation program that's working directly in the field. And their work actually is for habitat. So the vast majority of the Asian species are um, are endangered because of habitat. So working with local communities, a ton of that work is, is working directly with those communities to figure out alternative livelihoods. Poverty is such a big problem. It's easy for us to sit here and talk about poaching and people shouldn't do it and we shouldn't be dealing with ivory and we shouldn't be seeing the decimation of rhinos because of their horn. But when you're dealing with the level of poverty that many, many, many of these areas are dealing with, it's something that we just, it's, it, we just can't comprehend that. So a lot of that work is actually focused right there in those villages to increase the livelihoods of the community there so that they, and, and, and awareness of what that animal is, so that they take a lot more pride in the animals that they have. 
Um, same work actually has to be done here. We're losing species here in the United States that we're not even aware of um, because some of the practices that we, that we do. So tons of awareness, but yes, sir. Conservation genetics. Well, they're an interesting department because there's nine of them when they're fully staffed. Uh, Dr. Ed Lewis is in charge of that department. And it started off as understanding when he was hired is understanding the genetics because that's something we have to monitor very carefully in our managed populations in zoos. So you guys come to the Omaha Zoo and you might see a tiger, you might see a rhino. Well, what we actually do in zoos is we work collectively as a group of AZA institutions. Um, it, it's easier to think about if you think about dogs. Um, there are certain breeds of dogs that don't, there aren't very many of them. So genetic diversity, say, is, is, is really important versus like a golden retriever where you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Well, we're on that rare breed side, if, if you think about it. And many of the species that we have here in all of our zoos, we have to manage that genetic diversity very, very closely. Because what we try to do across all of the 200 and plus AZA institutions is manage the population of a certain species based on the fact that we will ensure that we will see them in 100 years. So we try to get that species to a genetic diversity where your kids and your grandkids and their grandkids will get to come see them somewhere. And to do that, we have to have geneticists that can help us understand their relatedness. And that's why we move animals all over. There was a big deal about Louie coming to live, the, our big elephant coming to the Omaha Zoo. Um, and so it's very critical that we manage that and we move animals from one AZA zoo to another AZA, AZA, AZA zoo based on um, their genetic diversity. So it started off as that, um, as just that, but Ed had a passion for Madagascar and the community in Madagascar. So now it's about the, it's primarily about the biodiversity and the genetics of the various lemur species and other species that live in Madagascar, also working with the community and reforesting. Um, so they have reforested over a million trees uh, through that work. So you don't think of genetics and trees uh, and replanting, but that's, that's primarily what they are doing now. So there have been 24 lemur species that have been identified through the department here at the Omaha Zoo. So kind of cool stuff, very cool stuff. Thank you for asking about them. Yes. Do you have any of those big boxes? Oh, well, one of my like high school students probably can answer that for you. I mean, I'm just like, I mean, just the number of species. I heard like, I mean, the number Yeah, and it kind of depends. It, it, is a, it is a large, large, large number, and we do lose them. The ones we're losing the fastest are actually some of the invertebrate species, um, such as mussels. Mussels are, freshwater mussels are in, in, in real trouble, and so nobody really likes to pay attention to those. Um, globally, interestingly, amphibians. 30% uh, of all surviving amphibian species are, are critically endangered. Uh, we're losing them at an alarming rate. And what's actually scarier, and what goes back to the genetics uh, question, is that a lot of these species, when I just said 24 lemur species, um, have been named through our genetics department here, one of them just uh, in the last few weeks, uh, we're losing species before they're even known, um, which is truly tragic. But of all of the taxa, it's actually frogs and toads that are the biggest problem when we're losing them very, very quickly. And they're indicators of how the, the health of the planet is actually doing. Yeah. So it's, that's a tough question. We'd have to look at all of, um, it's not as many mammals and birds as you think. It's actually predominantly a lot of the invertebrates. Coral, uh, coral is another one that uh, we're losing a lot of species very quickly. Yes. Outside of the zoo, as humans, what can we do on a daily basis? Yeah, if you didn't hear that question, what a be beautiful question, thank you. Um, what can we all do? And everybody can be part of conservation. I always tell everybody, come to the zoo, um, because you come to the zoo and part of your gate ticket, part of you buying a Coke, part of you going to the gift shop, part of every dollar is actually coming to the budget that I manage that I get to send out. Um, and that's really fun. Getting back those letters from the researchers in the field is really incredible. So you guys coming to the zoo, you're actually part of conservation, which is really, really cool. But on a daily basis, it's reducing and reusing. Um, you know, plastics are probably the biggest problem that are facing our oceans and plastic, uh, plastic bags from the grocery store. 
Um, if you guys just go by Walmart over in Council Bluffs and look south into that, uh, into that field, it makes me sick every time I drive by it. It's full of plastic bags that are on the interstates. You see them all over, blown all over. Um, getting in the habit of using reusable bags when you go to the grocery store. Uh, eliminating straws, you know, reducing straws. If you don't need a straw, you know, it's such a habit for me to grab a straw uh, when, I'm, when I'm actually out at the, you know, when I'm getting something at fast food particularly. And do we need it? No, we probably don't. I think we can all drink out of a cup. Um, so eliminating those single-use items. You know, certain people, my husband actually has a neurological disease. He has to have a straw. Um, but a lot of us don't. So those are, those are the simple, simple ways that, that, you, that you can help. Certainly finding a project, if you're passionate about a species, then by all means, uh, by all means do it. Karma and I are kind of passionate about rhinos. Um, so we've teamed up with International Rhino Foundation and we're doing a second-a-thon uh, for at the National Agility Championship next month in Reno. So everything we make, hopefully we'll all run clean, um, will go back to, to rhinos. So doing, um, doing things like that, finding something that you're passionate about and, support, and supporting it. But, yep, great question. I don't want to keep you guys too much longer, so have a good, good? Thank you. You're welcome.